So here we are at the fourth clip of this week's lecture on decolonizing question mark. Um, and I guess this is the central clip because this is the clip where I'll talk you through um, the kind of idea that um, this proposal for uh, decolonization of anthropological thinking uh, basically amounts to or um, the central kind of move of argument that um, myself um, and a whole bunch of other people as well in different ways uh, have um, been involved in. Uh, the so-called ontological turn, um, as I say, stemming from a whole array of different influences, um, but coming together really in the kind of turn of the 21st century uh, and the first couple of decades. Um, I just uh, a couple, three years ago, I think, uh, wrote a book with uh, my good friend and colleague, Morton Peterson, called The Ontological Turn and Anthropological Exposition, where we kind of go through all of that. If you, any of you want to read any bits of that, I'll very happily send you uh, chapters and stuff. You don't have to go out and buy the book. <laughs> Nothing worse than, in my opinion, a lecturer trying to flog their book to their students. I hate that. Um, so no disrespect to colleagues who might do that. <laughs> So anyway, this is the clip where I introduce you to, to or just explain really what the central idea is. And I'm going to do it through diagrams. So we saw we ended the previous clip with a kind of eh, eh, on the uh, kind of ethnocentric um, infrastructure of anthropology, which produces a kind of conceptual colonialism, as I've argued. Right. And I think one way of summarizing the point that I ended up with there uh, in, in that clip is that both uh, options, very broadly speaking, explanation versus interpretation that are facilitated by that ontological conceptual infrastructure of uh, anthropology are colonizing. Uh, I guess one way of putting it is it, in the sense that the assumption in both cases is that the resources for understanding, making sense, engaging with, analyzing, etc., accounting for the phenomenon that you're studying, your object of study, come from uh, the camp of the anthropologist, if you like, right? That the society or the culture or the conceptual infrastructure and repertoire that's at the disposal of the anthropologist is equipped to either explain or interpret and everything in between. Uh, and every combination of those two, as we've seen in, in various theories, there's no single theory that is either fully explanatory or fully interpretive. They always combine elements of both. And uh, those resources for achieving that are at the disposal of the anthropologist uh, in order to do that, right? And that assumption that the anthropologist is equipped to explain or to interpret the phenomena is a colonizing assumption because it assumes that we have at our disposal, everything that we need, and that, that there's nothing out there in the world that we might encounter that we might not be equipped to explain or understand with the repertoires uh, of concepts and, and categories and so on that we have at our disposal. And that's the kind of, there's a kind of arrogance to that which has an inherently colonizing logic to it. So, what might a decolonizing thinking look like? Uh, I call this the recursive method. Uh, I'll explain in a minute why I call it that. Uh, it's a kind of feedback loop uh, in which your expose, exposure as an anthropologist to the phenomenon, the object of study that you're trying to understand, uh, has a feedback uh, um, reflexive kind of backwards loop back into your own thinking and shifts it. And really those three positions as opposed to two positions that I have here, all of my previous diagrams have had two positions, this has three positions, mark the, the way in which that shift can occur in anthropological um, thinking, in this recursive feedback loop that I'm talking about, right? Now, one thing that I wanna make absolutely clear from the outset in explaining this way of thinking uh, is that those bubbles there, those circles, do not describe societies or cultures. It might be a little bit misleading, but I've used the same shape as in the previous diagram. In the previous diagram, there was indeed that assumption that those positions were socio-cultural positions. 
This diagram here is a diagram of the process of anthropological thinking. And the blue um, uh, bubble or circle in the top left is the initial uh, set of assumptions, concepts, things that the anthropologist, in engaging with whatever object of study they might seek to engage with, takes for granted, takes of this as their starting point, right? That's all that that circle describes. Where those assumptions come from and so on is a separate question. It's a related, interesting question. But in principle, those assumptions can come from anywhere. It's just the idea that whenever you set up to engage with someone or something, you start from a particular uh, set of assumptions, initial assumptions, right? Um, what kinds of things exist, what concepts you might use in order to describe the world around you and so on. Those are the initial conditions from which you start the project of intellectual uh, engagement that anthropology involves, right? And the second bubble on the right, the kind of bright red one, is the ethnographic material, the object of description that the anthropologist seeks to engage with, to make sense of, to understand, right? Again, that doesn't describe a society or a culture. Uh, it describes just what features in the act of doing anthropology as an object of inquiry. In principle, this diagram could fit just as well with just about anything that one tries to understand, including your partner, your pet, <laughs> your baby, in my case. <laughs> Uh, very interesting um, procedure, how you begin to try to engage and understand a little creature that can't speak, right? Um, it could be just about anything uh, that we're talking about here, right? As long as you have a person trying to make sense of something, uh, you've got the, uh, the recursive feedback loop that I'm talking about here. So those two positions are not equivalent uh, to the positions in the previous diagrams because they describe a relationship of thought, not a cross-cultural geopolitical distribution of social cultural configurations as anthropologists are habituated to thinking. You know? Of course, uh, the initial assumptions and the ethnographic material might be located geographically, for sure. Uh, but the point is that this diagram does not try to depict that geographical, geopolitical translation or explanation and so on. It's rather trying to depict um, the, the procedure of anthropological thinking that might allow anthropological thinking to operate in a decolonized uh, way, right? So fundamentally, the idea here is that from the position of your initial assumptions, when you try and render yourself vulnerable to your object of study, there is always the possibility, it's not necessarily always the case, but it is at least possible, certainly in anthropology, that the object of study that you've sought to engage with in somehow goes beyond your capacity to understand it, that you are not equipped to make sense of it, right? That in encountering that object, you might reach the limitations of your own initial assumptions your conceptual repertoire, your procedures of thinking, um, what you take for granted, what you think makes sense and what doesn't make sense and so on, right? And that when and if that happens, you've reached the end of your resources. The only thing that you can do productively in your encounter with this object of inquiry is to try and invent new resources, to shift your own ways of thinking to reconstitute and critically recalibrate and reinvent the assumptions that you bring to bear in your attempt to understand what you're trying to understand. So effectively, what we've got here is a, a set of relationships between things or between positions. You've got your initial assumptions, you've got your ethnographic material, your object of description, and you've got the possibility of what I will use that, again, controversial word to describe, of alterity, of difference, right? Something that you're not equipped, that is different enough from the kinds of assumptions that you would ordinarily make, uh, that makes you feel that you've reached your limits of your capacity to understand what's going on. 
that moment of alterity, which usually in anthropology registers as a moment of misrecognition, where you attempt to explain, to, sorry, to describe the phenomena that you're trying to understand fails and produces some kind of uh, contradictory statement, right? That's usually when you know that you've reached the limits of your ability to understand what's going on, is that your best attempt to describe it produces a nonsense, a contradiction of some kind, right? That is uh, the moment that precipitates that backwards arrow in the middle, the arrow of reflexivity. So this is very much a reflexive approach, very much kind of building on the reflexive turn of the 1980s. But it's a reflexivity that does not only invite you to think about your own positionality as a social, cultural, political, etc. being, but ultimately requires you to think of your own uh, positionality in terms of the categories of thinking that you're using when reaching this impasse or impasse in your attempt to understand, right? So you've got to be reflexive, not only about your position as a socio-cultural being, but ultimately about your positioning in your very attempt to understand what it is that you're trying to understand. What is it about my way of thinking? What is it about the categories that I use that leads me to misdescribe or misrecognize the object that I'm trying to understand? That's the kind of key question of the reflexivity here. And this is really a, a kind of conceptual or if you like ontological reflexivity. Why? Because it requires you to think about the basic categories that you're using in your thinking. For example, categories such as the ones we looked at in the clip before, the distinction between nature and culture, for example. And to uh, realize that if that's as far as your thinking can go, your thinking is too limited to have a purchase and really uh, be able to make sense or even to describe the phenomenon that you're trying to understand. And therefore, you need to be reflexive about it. And crucially, that's the next step. You need to be prepared to shift it. You need to be, able, be prepared to be able to say that, OK, if I've reached the limits of my capacity to describe what I'm, what I'm trying to describe, then really all I can do is to push beyond those limits by trying to critically uh, undermine the distinctions that led me to this uh, dead end and create new distinctions, reconstitute my way of thinking, invent new categories, invent new ways of thinking that might allow me adequately to describe the phenomena that I'm seeing in a way that does not land me in a contradiction, does not land me into nonsense. So what new concepts might, might I be able to invent uh, to, to arrive at, to reflectively create? Right? This is a pro process that is really thoroughly creative that would allow me those new concepts, those new relationships that I, or between concepts that would allow me to describe the phenomenon that I'm trying to describe. Right? So here, the real uh, act that anthropology uh, requires is not one of explanation or interpretation, but rather acts of conceptualization. That's the key thing, right? Um, the problem is not why things are the way that they are, right? As explanation tries to, to interpret, right? Uh, the question is, uh, how can I even describe them cogently, right? Uh, what kind of categories do I need to arrive at in order to be able to do that? And that, crucially, that shift from your initial position, your initial assumptions to some new analytical concepts, new ways of thinking, is, I would suggest, a decolonizing uh, move, right? Because it's a move, fundamentally, as the way I see it, of humility. Because it's a move that you have to make when you realize that your uh, resources for thinking are inadequate. So you're not exporting your ideas to the object of study, as we saw before, and thereby colonizing it. Rather, you're allowing your vulnerability to your object of study to shift your way of thinking, to push you in a new direction. So in some ways, it kind of inverts the relationship of uh, conceptual colonialism. It's the object of study that shifts you, that moves you, rather than you trying to encompass the, the uh, object of study as an analyst. Right. So 
your inability to describe whatever it is that you're trying to describe, and that might be, for example, a society that was traditionally, or a phenomenon that takes place in a society that was traditionally a colonized society. Uh, that might be the case, it might not be the case, but it might also be the case. Um, anthropology is still an entirely global discipline, so it's complete, completely uh, grappling with these kinds of um, colonial kind of legacies in all of the societies in which it's working, right, as we saw last week. So when you're grappling with trying to describe such uh, a position, then it's giving the, it's, uh, giving the kind of first word uh, to that position, that position of the colonized, to shift your uh, modes of thinking and thereby uh, decolonize your uh, conceptual repertoire, your procedures for thinking. That's the central uh, idea. So now all that was extremely abstract, I'm aware of it. So I'm going to, I actually have in the PowerPoint two examples. Uh, one of it is from my own work uh, and it's how I um, um, try to do that uh, kind of conceptual decolonization with the concept of truth, which is so fundamental and central to the epistemology of all sciences and all disciplines, including anthropology. And I tried by um, trying to uh, en uh, encounter and engage with uh, ethnographic material uh, uh, relating to the way that diviners operate in Cuba, where I worked, uh, forms of divination that originate in West Africa and that arrived in Cuba with the transportation of the Atlantic slave trade of people to work in the sugar plantations that Sidney Mintz was talking about uh, in Haiti and elsewhere, well, also in Cuba. And these uh, people brought with them a whole array of practices, including divination. And divination is a practice of forging truth, of arriving at the truth. Uh, but it's a very different kind of truth from the kind of truth that anthropologists uh, for themselves claim to be arriving at uh, in their own activity as anthropologists. So I put those two things next to each other and sought to see how uh, the conception of truth that the diviners uh, have or the practices of truth that the diviners engage in might shift the concept of truth that we as anthropologists deploy in our attempt to understand people such as those diviners, right? And therefore precipitated that reconceptualization move where I arrived at a different concept of truth, which I called infinition for reasons that you can read my book uh, if you're interested, or I can send you anything if you're interested um, uh, that I explained there. I won't go into that whole argument, but that, uh, it's just illustrative of the move that I'm talking about. Through the exposure to this divinatory uh, system in, in, in Cuba, in my fieldwork, I basically found myself in a position of having to shift my own thinking about what could count as truth in the first place, what concept of truth we need in order to be able to describe what these dividers are doing and arrived at a new position which I gave a new name to because it was a different conceptualization of truth than the ones that were available to me when I was trying for size various concepts of truth from Western philosophy and so on and finding them all inadequate to the attempt to describe uh, Cuban divination the way that I found it in my fieldwork. I'm not going to use that example. It's on the PowerPoint. You can look at it if you want. And as I say, you know, we can discuss it. But I'm going to use just the example here of a really classic anthropological argument, um, which is uh, the argument about uh, gifts and the relationship to people. Uh, and I use that precisely because it is such a classic argument, because, of course, uh, we've referred to it already in the lecture on structuralism. It refers to Marcel Moser's famous essay on the gift which in a way, as we'll see, takes us half the way there. The other half, we need to go to another much more recent book, but not that recent now, 1988, it was published by the great British anthropologist, Marilyn Strathern, who published a book called The Gender of the Gift, which in a way can be presented as completing the, the half uh, finished, if you like, conceptual move uh, that Marcel Mauss was trying to precipitate in his original essay from the beginning of the 20th century, right? Now, this is a synthesis of my own. This is not, in fact, how Marilyn Strathern necessarily presents her own argument, but it's the way that I want to present it to you, it's the way that I understand it. But I really want to use it as an illustration of the kind of decolonizing move uh, that I'm talking about. And I also chose the example of the gift because I want to uh, convey to you uh, the idea that I really believe is absolutely fundamental 
that even though this stuff that I'm talking about today, this recursive method, the ontological turn, have been put on the table really in the last 10, 15, 20 years, more or less in anthropology in an explicit way, as I say, perhaps Viveros de Castro is the anthropologist who's began this thought process most explicitly and talked about it in terms of ontology and so on. The move of thinking of shifting your own cons basic conceptual categories in order to make sense of what uh, you're encountering as an anthropologist, what you're engaging with as an anthropologist, really has always been with us in anthropology. And all of the most exciting moments uh, in classical uh, or not so classical uh, anthropological uh, arguments that one might learn about uh, as a student, the kinds of things that you've been learning in your, in your courses, for me, have that in common. It's this kind of aha moment, this kind of shift in your thinking, saying, really, can you think of it that way? I never thought that this, this, thought this kind of thinking was possible. There's always that element of reconceptualizing, of questioning fundamental conceptual assumptions and being reflexive and creative with them that I think goes with the best that anthropology has to offer. So the ontological turn, the kind of decolonizing arguments that I'm making now have always been present, I would say, in anthropology. And that would be actually my kind of positive message about the, the potential of anthropology for truly radical thinking and that having always been there and that um, the kind of critiques on the kind of imbrication between anthropology and colonialism need to be held always in, our, in the forefront of our mind, but need to be brought into interaction with that other insight about anthropology, which is its critical potential. And I think those two things, which push in, two, in different directions, but also speak to each other, really the, the combination of the highly critical and the still um, uh, recognizing the potential of anthropology to, to, to kind of um, create new possibilities for thinking, including decolonized thinking, you need to kind of keep those thoughts together, I think, if you want to arrive at a nuanced argument about this uh, whole uh, question of decolonization of the curriculum of anthropology and so on. So um, that's what I, what, you know, the position that I will take uh, on that question. So let me illustrate um, the idea with reference to this classic um, uh, argument on gifts. So, you know, of course, I won't go into any detail here, but let me just illustrate how the moves might work. So uh, you've got a situation where your initial assumption, the kind of commonsensical assumption with which um, Marcel Mauss operates in the essay on the gift, which he takes as his obvious point of departure, is that gifts are objects that circulate between people, right? So I give you a birthday present, you unwrap it and so on. I had it in my hands, you now have it in your hands. This is a thing that I gave you, I don't know, um, a CD. No, CDs are not things that you even use. Uh, I don't even know what I'd give you. Tickets to a concert or something, I don't know. And, uh, and you would receive that. And you know, the ticket was in my hand and it's in your hand and we're two people and that's the way it is, right? So if you remember, Marcel Mauss's question is, why is it that when someone receives a gift, they feel an obligation to return it? So why is this circulation of things between people reciprocal, right? Now, the initial ontological assumption that Marcel Mauss is making, the conceptual, the cardinal conceptual distinction on which he's relying in order to set up the problem of the essay of the gift is a distinction between people and things. Uh, animate people and inanimate uh, things, subjects and objects, if you like. That's a distinction that he needs in order to set up his problem. He relies on it. It's common sense. His readers understand it. We all know that, right? Some things are things, some things are people, if you like, and that's the way it is, right? But then, if you remember, when he develops his argument, one of the key, key moments, perhaps the most famous moment, is when he engages with the Ranapiri's, uh, uh, this uh, Maori uh, sage's uh, report or explanation to this colonial uh, ethnographer or ethnologist, Eldon Best, with whom um, the um, uh, Tamati Ranapiri, uh, the Maori uh, elder, was discussing and explaining the reciprocity of gifts. Uh, which is this 
famous kind of snippet of text that um, that Morse quotes in order to build his theory of reciprocity, where Tamati Ranapiri says that the reason that people return gifts among the Maori is that they understand that a gift contains the ho, uh, which is the kind of translated by Morse as the spirit or the spiritual essence of the person who gives it, the spirit of the donor. The, because, and it's because the, the gift contains the taonga, the, the valuable article, as Marcel Mauss translates it, which is the gift, contains the spirit of the person who gave it, that therefore the person who receives it effectively receives a part of the person who gave the gift to them and therefore is bound in a relationship of reciprocity with that person, right? So the crucial moment in Marcel Mauss's argument is this idea drawn from Maori uh, ways of uh, engaging with each other and conceptualizing those engage engagements um, at that time in the late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, when those kind of ethnological materials were being collected in a highly colonial situation, of course, right? And in a highly colonial way. That kind of text precipitates the argument that Marcel Mauss makes. And the crucial, one crucial part uh, of uh, Marcel Mauss's argument is essentially to show that the distinction between things and people uh, isn't adequate uh, to describe um, the reciprocal gift exchange in Oceania or in New Zealand in this case particularly. I mean obviously his argument goes beyond New Zealand but he's using the material here specifically with respect to Maori uh, practices, right? So there's a breakdown of the initial assumptions that Marcel Mauss makes uh, and he ends up having to use those that terminology, right? And say that for the Maori gifts contain people right? Gifts contain the spirit of the person. Now, Morse's description of the Maori material is profoundly unsatisfactory because he's, he's reached the limits of his conceptual repertoire, but because he doesn't have any alternative concepts to use, he has to describe these uh, practices as Maori beliefs according to which uh, things contain sp spirits. Right now, the, the key point from the point of view of the argument that I'm trying to, that I'm developing here is that um, the fact that uh, Marcel Mauss has reached the limits of his conceptual repertoire lands him in a position of having to describe Maori practices and thoughts and the uh, Tamati Ranapiri's conceptualization of how gift reciprocity works and, and, and why it's so important in a way that is actually self-contradictory. Because if you actually know in English, according to the concepts that the way that we understand them, what a thing is or what an object is and what a spirit is and what a person is, you know that what defines a thing and what distinguishes a thing from a person is that it precisely it does not have a spirit. So when you say, as Marcel Mauss does, that the Maori believe uh, or believed then that things have spirits, right? You're essentially ascribing a nonsensical sentence to the people that you're trying to describe, right? Because if we know what a thing is, we know that it's precisely something that does not have a spirit. Only people have spirits according to the initial assumptions that are built into our language of description. So we've essentially described the, the phenomenon that we're trying to uh, articulate in a way that is self-contradictory. We've landed ourselves in a conceptual muddle. Now, according to this decolonizing kind of line of thinking that I'm trying to develop here, this is the reflexive moment when you realize that you've landed yourself in a conceptual muddle and that, that your best attempt to describe, in this case, Maori material uh, issues a mis description, a misrecognition, a contradiction, then what you are required to do is to rethink your categories. And that is exactly what Marilyn Strathern actually does in her book, uh, The uh, Gender of the Gift, 
Now, the context in which Strathern develops her argument is different. It's uh, based not in New Zealand, but in Papua New Guinea, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, where she did fieldwork. Uh, it does concern ceremonial exchange, uh, similar to the Maori materials. Um, but the ethnographic situation is different, and also the spin of the argument is different, because for Strathern, one of the key questions here is the gendered dimension of these exchanges. Um, uh, now, all of that is massively important and interesting, and I massively encourage you to read Strathern's book. But this is not the aspect of her argument that I'm highlighting here. Just excuse me. I'm highlighting uh, more specifically the reconstitution that her argument implies of the distinction between things and people. Because what Strathern effectively says in The Gender of the Gift is that in order to be able to describe, not interpret, not explain, but merely just to describe in a cogent way ceremonial exchange in the highlands of Papua New Guinea in, this, in, in, her, ca in her case, you need to do away with some of the most central concepts with, it, with which you are operating. And crucially, you need to do away with the idea of the individual person. Um, the only way that you can describe um, uh, a ceremonial gifts exchange in Papua New Guinea for Strathern is to shift your very definition of what might count as a person from seeing people as being separate from each other. Remember this idea of gifts being exchanged between people. I'm here, you're there and the gift circulates between us, and rather seeing people as composed out of all of the relationships into which they enter. And gift giving, ceremonial gift giving, being a way of modulating this composition of persons. So I am composed through my relationship with you, right? And when I give a gift to you, I highlight the composition of my being as a person in relation to you. That's what the gift does. Now, I am a composite, right, uh, as a person of all of the relationships into which I enter, right? But at some moments, I might foreground some of those relationships, and in other moments, I might foreground others of those relationships. This is uh, what Strathern calls eclipsing relations, right? Certain things eclipse other things, and the exchange of gifts does exactly that. It foregrounds some relations and puts other, other relations in the background, right? Uh, and that foregrounding and backgrounding, by the way, is a very gendered process for, for Strathern, and hence the gender, the gender of the gift, right? Now, this idea that uh, people are composed, are constituted through the relations through in which they enter, and that gift giving is a way of precipitating and modulating those relationships, harks directly back to, the, to what Tamati Ranapiri um, uh, was saying when he was articulating this idea that the gift contains a part of the person who gives it, such that the person who receives it receives essentially a part of the other person. This is the most graphic way of describing exactly the analytical move that Strathern thinks we need to make in order to make sense or to, to be able to describe gift giving, such as the activities that um, Tamati Ranapiri was describing in his account, right? So essentially what you have here is a completely different image of gift exchange, a relational image in which uh, as gifts pass from one person to another, that person and the other person effectively interpenetrate each other, become relationary, relationally co-constituted so that the, my personhood is defined in terms of your personhood if and when you give me a gift. And by giving gifts, that mutual definition of people as relational compositions rather than individuals with limits and autonomy and, autonomy and so on are, um, uh, comes to the fore analytically. Right? So effectively, Strathern, in order to make sense of gift exchange, needs to, to kind of go on a conceptual journey from the initial presupposition of uh, people as individual, sovereign, kind of autonomous beings and separate from each other, and to, be, and to be distinguished from inanimate gifts, to a position informed by the Melanesian ethnography, whereby she has to reinvent her analytical language and talk of people as relations. 
not people that enter into relations with each other, but rather people who are themselves relations. And those relations, crucially, are modulated through the relational technology that is the gift. So the gift itself is relational. So this distinction between the person and the thing that is the gift breaks down, exactly as Marcel Mauss was describing. Crucially, though, the difference between Strathern and Mauss is that Strathern is developing the analytical conceptual vocabulary in order to be able to articulate this situation. So this relational uh, conceptual uh, repertoire that she develops, which goes along with a kind of neologism that Strathern employs, she actually borrows it from a South Asianist called McKim Marriott, of saying that, well, because of this relational co-constitution of, of people, we can't really call people individuals anymore because precisely people divide themselves um, through constituting themselves in relation to others because I enter into many relations and I'm the composite of all of these different relations into which I enter uh, when I participate in these practices of gift exchange and many other practices in Melanesian society. So therefore we should call uh, people individual rather than individual, right? Now, this neologism is really indicative of what's going on here. Strathern is effectively having to invent a new language because she feels that the language that was available to her uh, previously, the language of individuals, of distinctions between people and things and so on, was inadequate. So neologism, the invention of new words, is a characteristic, uh, actually, of this way of thinking because these recursive feedback loops that precipitate uh, acts of conceptual invention on the part of anthropologists that shift their conceptual repertoire uh, are kind of registered in the language of uh, new concepts, new, new, new ideas being articulated sometimes through new words. So my own kind of um, christening, uh, in fact, Viveros de Castro uh, suggested this uh, term to me and I kind of adopted it greedily from, from, from his brain of calling the truth in Cuban divination infinition, for reasons that I won't explain, is another example of that. I needed a new word to describe the new concept of truth that I had to arrive at uh, as an anthropologist. But the, really the crucial point that I want to drive home here is the way in which this uh, relates to the demand for a decolonized uh, thinking. As I said in the beginning, this is a situation in which your own thinking is shifted by your exposure to another person's or another people or another social situation uh, that somehow challenges it, right? So it requires a kind of, kind of, a kind of conceptual uh, preparedness to admit that you aren't able to deal with everything uh, uh, with the conceptual repertoires that are available to you. But then it also gives you the possibility of saying, well, you might be able to invent um, new ways of thinking uh, through your created engagements with the material that you're, uh, that, that, that you're encountering with. And that move of conceptual of conceptualization is actually precipitated by the encounter with your object of study. So in some ways you might want to say that what Strathern was doing was in a way Melanesianizing, you know, her ethnography was in Melanesia, she was kind of Mel Melanesianizing Melanesianizing um, the repertoire of anthropological thinking uh, by shifting it in that way, right? Melanesian operations and gift exchange have a reciprocal effect on the way you're thinking. And that, uh, I would argue, is a moment of decolonization in the sense that the categories that um, are used um, to kind of, um, that form the foundation uh, of colonial projects are called into question and actually shifted in some ways, potentially, right? Uh, and that for me is an exciting prospect and that's really the, 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 the argument of the uh, decolonization of anthropological thinking as an intellectual project. Now, in the final clip, I'll say a few critical things about this, but um, I hope that it makes sense um, in the way that I've described it. See you in the next clip.